Amen. Good morning, church. You know, I was uh, as we were worshiping, I was realizing this is the this is the first service in two and a half years where all of the songs were in English. Yeah. (laughs) That I've been to, and I was well. I mean, we had a little bit of Latin there with uh, whatever that phrase whatever that phrase is. But guys, it's good to be back here in in Knoxville. Um, For those of you that don't know, um, this is my wife, Abigail. And uh, we have. Ne- next week we would have been married for three months, so we're uh, we're a very young married couple. But it is really great uh, to be back in Knoxville and um, and to to deliver this communion for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, I think it's amazing to be here. We were here in July of last year. We had just started dating then. I think it was a week to the day when we were here doing communion. Um, and it's just amazing to think that then I was so incredibly nervous to be here. I was like freaking out. And now it just feels like I'm talking to family. Um, and I'm just really, really grateful. Uh, we were able to, I think it was this Wednesday, be at the yeah. little family group house for some sponsors. That was just phenomenal. And I just think it's amazing that we're a part of an international family that is really family. So yeah. it's great to be here. Amen. And uh, it's kind of cool because there's some of you in the room that uh, that knew me when I was running around as a little 10-year-old. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, now now that I'm you know old and, and grown, uh, and, and bringing my wife back. It's just really cool to see. And there's lots of different changes that have happened. I mean, I, I see lots of new faces in the room. I've heard of lots of people that have moved in. Uh, I, I try my best to keep up with what's happening here in Knoxville. I, I watch the YouTube sermon. Uh, I'm one of the channel watching what's going on here. Uh, I even read a couple of the chapters of the, the book you guys are going through on, uh, on, on Wednesday midweek services, I think. I enjoyed the, the few chapters that I read. Uh, I've watched all the things when the Statins would come in, the Browns would come in, uh, Dr. Steve Kennard that came in and did the, the church history workshop. I mean, I listened to all of that. That seemed incredible. And so even though I'm all the way in Johannesburg, I'm still keeping up with what's happening in Knoxville. Uh, my dad and Dan got appointed as elders, uh, which is incredible. There's, he was even telling me this morning in Nashville, they're appointing three elders, uh, which I believe might be their first. I'm not exactly sure. But either way, there's things happening in Nashville that are, that are really good. Um, also, I want to I wanna recognize Dr. Gabrielle. I mean, congratulations there. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, what an incredible accomplishment. So great things are happening uh, here in Knoxville. Uh, and so we're going to share the Christmas story with you guys, as this is our Christmas service. And so in order to do that, let's turn to Genesis chapter 1, where the Christmas story starts. That's all right. Now, as we turn to Genesis chapter 1, how many of you guys made a Christmas list this year? Okay, don't be ashamed. It's a very normal thing to do this time of year is make a Christmas list. Usually it's the things that you want or things that you're hoping someone will get for you. Um, but I want to make, I, I want us to make a different Christmas list this morning, okay? So I want you to make a Christmas list, and I want to I get some responses, just, just a few responses on, on this Christmas list. Think of the ways that you wish people treated each other or ways that you wish people treated you. And I just want to hear some responses. What are those things that you would put on the list of ways you wish people treated each other and ways you wish people treated you or ways you wish the world treated each other? Yeah. Okay, with great mercy. Awesome. Empathy. Empathy. Yeah. Okay, respect. Respect. There you go. Patience. Gratitude, kindness, mm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Healthy dealing with conflict, you know, that could be it, yeah. Honesty, without judgment, humility, yeah, grace, maturity, with love. I mean, we can keep going on and on and on, right? It, and I think no matter what your answer is, it's probably fairly similar to everybody else's answer. Some things just that I wrote down is uh, people serving others before themselves, uh, a world where people are listened to and respected, uh, people were understood before they were judged, uh, even practical things like food was available for everybody. It actually is, it's just not distributed right. So I wish a world was where everybody had the food that they needed. Uh, financial self-control, where there was no you know, even personal or governmental or countrywide financial corruption. Because everyone just took care of what they needed, responsibly. Love, where people loved themselves, they loved others, they loved the, the world. I mean, would anyone disagree with the list that we're all kind of making here? 
And let's just keep that in mind as we read Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start reading uh, in verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, over every living creature that moves along the ground. The pinnacle of God's creation was him making humans in his own image. And if what that means to be in God's image is he designed us to be a reflection or representation of who he was. Up until this point, and in almost every religion in the world, Humans are not the image of God. It's either a statue or made of wood or stone or gold or, or something else that represents God. But God was unique, and he said, I want a living, breathing human that makes decisions to be the one that represents me. So if we were to think of, of well, who, how does God treat people? Who is God? I think every word that we just said describes who God is. So the very world that we just said wish existed was the very world God intended from the very beginning. If God treated people with mercy, we, as his reflection, were supposed to treat people with mercy. If God is respectful and empathetic and uh, full of grace and humility, then we as well should have grace and humility and treat people with love and respect. If God would not want to see someone have food and someone not have food, then we should also treat people the same. That is the world God made from the very beginning. And it's so uncanny that all of us naturally desire that world. God knew what he was doing when he made us. That was the garden. God with us and humanity with him. Perfectly united. That is heaven on earth. That is everything we could want. But as you know, we are not good at making the decisions of reflecting God. So Adam and Eve decided to reflect themselves and not reflect God. And now, we're, now we have the broken world that we live in today. So from the very first page of Genesis, God has set the story. We have broken it. And for the rest of the Bible, God is chasing after us and building the greatest story to have ever been written in reality, God with us. Um, since the fall, since we're kind of like with the story now, God has been reaching out time and time again to his people, hoping that they would allow him to once again simply be with them. He looked, up to the, he looked down on the earth and he had chosen people to partner with. He saw Noah and his righteousness and he partnered with him. He reached out to Abraham and established a covenant. He then became known as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And as he partnered with these patriarchs, he reached out to them hoping that they would walk with him and be a vessel of God's being to the people around him. And when we get to the story of the enslaved Israelites, God hears the cries of his people, and he reaches out to Moses. Uh, let's turn to Exodus 6 for now. Moses takes up the call after much deliberation and debate, um, and he responds to God's word. As a result, we have these narratives and poems and stories that make up the Old Testament, all telling of God's greatness, or how God, or, or all of how God had rescued Israel, how He had brought them up out of Egypt, and very early on in this narrative, God tells Moses the why, the reason behind all of this. Exodus six verses six to seven, God says to Moses, "Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them." And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. God just simply wanted relationship with him. He wanted to be with his people. He wanted to walk with them in the cool of the day, just as he had in Eden. But as Eden had shown us with humans, it's never as simple as it's supposed to be or as it's meant to to be, because we struggle to choose the good that's right in front of us. We struggle to see a good thing as it is. Mm -hmm. We really struggle to choose it 
I know that we all relate to this. We know what's good for us. You know, we should all be exercising and eating right and, you know, living a good old healthy life. Um, but we sort of choose that. I recently really, like, I'm a new woman. I am married. I have a new, I'm a new house. I have a husband. I'm trying to take charge of my life. And I'm like, I want to get back into running. And I want to be a healthy old woman. And that's been difficult because um, it's hard to be disciplined. Um, but I've really been trying to choose that, and I've even like, we've been like, okay, not school's going to be great because I don't have to get up so early for work, so I'm going to get up early every morning and run. I ran once, Come and on. we've been here for a week. <laughs> yeah. Amen for that once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we, re- we struggle to choose the good that's right in front of us. And just like we struggle to choose these simple good things, the Israelites struggle to, chose a God, to choose a God who created a good boy for them. They struggled to choose a God who redeemed them from slavery. They complained against God. They built idols in the desert. They worshipped them, and they disobeyed God consistently. But God's heart stayed the same. Just as he was in Eden, so he was in Exodus. He just wanted to be with his people. And as we were in Eden, so we were in Exodus. We were sinful and incapable of stepping into the presence of God. And so God designed the tabernacle. Um, in Exodus 25, verse 8, it says, Then let them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them, make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. After the scripture, there are seven chapters describing the building of the tabernacle. And um, the tabernacle is a beautiful thing, and I am simply just going to geek out about it for a moment. Um, it was a tent within a courtyard that faced east. And if you follow the story from Genesis 1, east is where Eden was. It was placed in the middle of the entire nation of Israel, and the first time God explicitly says, I have poured out my spirit on someone, is in Exodus 31, where he says that he appointed Bezalel as the, essentially the creative director of the tabernacle. Um, it was a beautiful thing. <laughs> it was incredibly colorful. Um, and the specific colors were red, blue, and purple, and white. And those were all reminiscent of God's holiness and his kingdom and his pure, pureness breaking into earth. It was filled with holy objects made of gold, but in all of this, natural imagery was used to point back to Eden. Almond flowers were hammered into the lampstand. The lampstand was the only form of light in the the holy place. Pomegranates were hemmed into the robes of the high priest. Natural scents of cinnamon and olive oil and frankincense and myrrh filled the tabernacle um, as the incense burned and as the anointed oil had consecrated all the holy things in the priests themselves. What this was was a little transportable Eden, a small intersection between heaven and earth that the Israelites could see and carry with them where they went. And that's why there are seven chapters describing it, and then six more chapters describing how they actually built it. And all of this, God designed this entire beautiful, amazing thing so that he could be with us, so that God with us could be real and tangible and right there. Now, as time went on and the Israelites moved into the Promised Land, Solomon then built the temple, which was a more permanent form of the tabernacle. And just as the tabernacle, the imagery of the temple was all full of natural things. It was all formed out of wood and gold, and palm trees were carved into this wood. And so since the beginning of time, God has desired nothing more than to be with his people. He planted and grew a garden for us to be able to walk with him. He split the sea and partnered with us in building a way for him to tangibly walk with us. He gave us land and bricks to build him a home. Yet as the Old Testament comes to a close and as the temple had been built, destroyed, and rebuilt, God was not done writing his story. The temple, just as the tabernacle, was always supposed to be a temporary way for him to be with us. God wouldn't settle for a subpar Eden replica. He wanted more. He wanted a tangible way again for him to be with us. So in the Garden of Eden, God was with us. I I don't know even what form or what shape that took as he walked in the Garden, but he was with us. And then we ran away. So God was like, I want want you to build a little tiny Eden to remember that I want to be with you. And it's told that the only place on earth that God lived was the tabernacle and then was the temple. So God was like, I want to build something to remind you of Eden when I'm with you. And then a permanent place in Jerusalem to remind you that I want to be with you. But we keep running from him. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. 
And this is where Jesus just, just comes on the scene and adds right into the story that God has been writing. Verse 18 says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she, found, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because her husband was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This time Jesus was like, or God was like, I'm going to come into flesh just so I can be with you. And so the birth of Jesus, it stands as the ultimate realization of God being with us. It is no longer behind the curtain of the tabernacle or within the stones of the temple. It is in the flesh and body of Jesus. Jesus, born of a woman and born into a world, he so desires to see reconciled back to himself. The birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, it was announced by angels, celebrated by magi. It was, it was the culmination of God's divine plan to bring humans back to himself. He wanted to restore the broken Eden that we had created. God wants to be with us in Eden, so he was willing to come into flesh to be with us. And so God with us, it's no longer this abstract theological concept of when I go behind a curtain in the temple, I can be with God. God said, I want it to be tangible. So I'm going to become flesh and bone just like you are flesh and bone. It is a reality in the person of Jesus. So in a a small cradle in Bethlehem, God broke the barrier between the divine and the mortal. And he unified them. In In that small town, the divine God and the human world were merged in the person of Jesus. So that we can again be with God. And he can be with us. So as we immerse ourselves in the wonder of the Christmas story, we find it's not just about the birth of a baby boy, but it's about the resounding echo of that name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And let's see how the story ends. Let's turn to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And it was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. God with us began in Genesis 1 in Eden. It kept going with the tabernacle and the temple and with Jesus, and God with us is exactly where it's going to end. When everything else passes away, we will be united with God perfectly again. What God is doing through Eden, as as we as his images, through the tabernacle of the birth of Jesus, is building the perfect world that we started with. Because of the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus, we can experience that world today as we wait for Jesus to bring the kingdom fully. All the things we set on our Christmas list that we wish were in the world, love and mercy and grace, because of God fighting to be with us, we can experience that world right now as we wait for Jesus to come back. And there will be no more tears. And there will be no more crying. And there will be no more pain. There will be no more death. All of the things in the world that we tangibly feel that hold us down will be passed away. And the only thing that will be left is a permanent Emmanuel. God always with us. Let's let's remember that and let's pray for some more. Father God, thank you so much that we get to come before you in such an easy way, by simply calling upon your name. Thank you that you have broken through every single barrier 
to simply walk through life with us. Thank you that you have loved us enough to go to the extreme by sacrificing your son, whom you love, for the sake of simply walking with us. God, we love you, and we pray that right now as we take the bread and the fruit of the vine, that we are reminded of what you have done that we are reminded of your immense love and grace and mercy and your ceaseless desire for us. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.